I pray that every Seventh-day Adventist Christian and every Seventh-day Adventist church, Lord Jesus, that this message will spread to them all and that they will not see me, the messenger, and wonder, who is this man? But Lord, that they will just be convicted at heart to follow and take heed to the message that you are giving this morning. So we ask this in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, my title of the sermon this morning is titled, A Message to All Seventh-day Adventists. A Message to All Seventh-day Adventists. If you will, open your Bible with me to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we'll begin our message here. Ezekiel chapter 33, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Say a good amen when you're there, saints. Amen. All right. Let us begin reading. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for the watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the what? Oh, come on, beloved, he blows the what? The trumpet and warn the who? The people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his what? His soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the hand of the watchman. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me when I say unto you, The wicked, O wicked man, that thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Number 9, verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, beloved, I have a question for you this morning. Is that warning that we just read from the book of Ezekiel, is that a very severe warning, saints? Absolutely. This warning is concerning a warning and taking heed to a warning. This warning is talking about a watchman. A watchman would sit up on a high place and he would look over the city of Israel. He would look over the city of Jerusalem. And if he saw any nations, any danger coming their way, he was supposed to blow the trumpet. He was supposed to what? Blow the trumpet. He was supposed to give this trumpet a certain sound, a battle cry, warning the nations, warning the people of the entire area that there is danger ahead and we need to get ready for war. But what did he say? If the watchman blows not the trumpet, all of the blood that is spilt, because he did not blow the trumpet and give the nation a warning, all of that blood that is spilt will be required at the watchman's hand. But if he blows the trumpet, and the message of warning was sent forth, and the people that heard the trumpet blow, if they did not take heed to that warning, and they died, their death is upon their own head. This is a very severe warning that God has given us in His Word. And I want to submit to you this morning, saints, that God has called us as Seventh-day Adventists to be watchmen. He has called us to be watchmen. Even Jesus Christ Himself preached the message. He said, watch, for you know not our your Lord doth come. Are we together? Watch. Now, I think we need to be very careful about what we're watching for. I don't believe that we should be caught up in this, this sensational fanaticism of alarmment. Can we say amen? 
There is ministries in the church and even outside of the church, independent of the church, that are blowing the trumpet about ridiculous things that we don't need to know about. Can we say amen? Wondering what Advent Health is doing and wondering what this ministry is doing and wonder what this minister said and how, and how someone gay has joined the church over here. Have mercy. What, what are we thinking to think that God has called us to share the dirty laundry of our church with the public? Can somebody say amen to that? God has not called us to share the dirty laundry of our sins with the public, but He has called us to be watchmen, that when we see things creeping into the church, we are to sound the alarm, but we're not to just sound the alarm, we are to make a change. Can somebody say amen? So this is not one of those messages where we're going to be sounding an alarm and talking a whole lot of bad about all the different things that's going on in the Adventist church, whether it be women's ordination or whether it be... Uh, uh, abortion, or whether it be these, these issues. Beloved, these are serious issues, no doubt about it, but I want to submit to you this morning that there are even other serious issues that are being neglected and not dealt with, and it's to the detriment of every local congregation's soul. You can tell this morning I'm speaking with much passion because I have seen this far too much in my travels as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dakota Day. I'm a public speaker and evangelist. I travel the globe. And I preach evangelistic campaigns to win souls to this church that I believe to be the remnant of Jesus Christ that is to spread the message to the world. I see lots of people give their lives to Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing. But what I'm starting to see more and more of, as I'm starting to see more people leave the church than I see come into the church. And the reason why I bring this message up this morning is because of why many of them are leaving the church. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you care that people are leaving our church? I hope that you do. It breaks my heart when I hear, I get a phone call that someone has left the church or backslidden or gone away from Jesus. Let's suppose you woke up one morning and you had a lump somewhere on your body that you was unaware of. And now all of a sudden you're aware of it and it's become very bulging and you're concerned that this uh, bump may be cancerous. So you go to the doctor and you you have the doctor to run scans, and they do all these scans to check to see if this bump, this lump, is cancerous. The doctor gets the, the report in. He has it in his hand, and on the report, it says, this is a cancerous lump, and it's getting bad. It's in stage two, and it's growing. You, you don't know it, but the doctor knows it, and he's sitting there with your diagnosis. He has the problem in hand, and then he call, walks in the room, and he asks you, would you like to know if you have cancer? What's going to be your response, beloved? Come on now. What's going to be your response? Yes. You want to know, because if you have cancer, you need to know what do you need to do about it. Can somebody say amen? So, beloved, here's the deal. We're living in a world today where when someone tells us we have a problem, we act like we don't have one. Is that true? It's true. But if a doctor tells you you have cancer, you're not going to ignore it. In fact, that's going to bother you, isn't it? Because that is a disease that leads to death very quickly. The reality is, beloved, is that there is a cancer that is pervading many of our churches, many of our local congregations, and must I say it's even worldwide and it's spreading and it's in the Seventh-day Adventist church. You say, Dakota, what are you talking about? Some doctrine, some teaching? No. Although there are many winds of doctrine blowing, that is nothing new. What I am to share with you this morning, beloved, is something that there is, I haven't heard one sermon about my entire life as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Thank you, brother. 
Think about this for a moment. I have been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian for six years. Six years. And in my six years of being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I cannot count the times that I have almost left the church over the issue that I'm about to be sharing with you today. Now, I've grown much in the Lord since having those thoughts. Can we say amen? But I'll tell you, many, many times the devil almost got me to leave. You see, I'm going to talk about the pink elephant in the room. The big, fat one that no one's talking about. I mean, we walk in almost every congregation you walk in nowadays. You walk in, and it's there, but no one's talking about it. At least from the pulpit, that is. All kinds of little whispering tales float around congregations from church member to church member about it, but no one's talking about it from the pulpit. Well, that changes today. This pink elephant that I'm referring to is this deadness that has creeped into our church, that is pervading our churches and spreading like a wildfire from congregation to congregation. You may be thinking, Dakota, what are you talking about, a deadness? If you're wondering what I'm talking about, that goes to speak of the problem. Let me tell you a quick story. You see, beloved, when I first heard the Adventist truth, the Adventist message, the three angels' messages that God has given us as a church to spread to the entire world. When I first heard these messages, I heard them over those old VHS tapes. How many of you remember those tapes? We don't see those in the stores anymore, do we? No, not at all. Maybe a pawn shop or a flea market. But that's about as extent as you'll see them. I came across these VHS tapes from Doug Batchelor and Amazing Facts and Mark Finley and Kenneth Cox. How many of you remember those brothers? Uh Uh-huh. How many of you can say when you watched those VHS tapes, because I know many of you here watched them, your heart was convicted and you were moved to be closer to Jesus? No doubt about it. I learned the precious truth. My family came out of the, the apostolic oneness Pentecostal faith, and we jumped from Pentecostal church to Pentecostal church to Pentecostal church, and then from other denominations, visiting many churches, studying with them. And then, finally, one day, we quit going to church because we, would not, we was not finding a church that taught the truth. And we said, we can't go to a church that's not teaching the truth. The entire county that I grew up in, in Mississippi County, there wasn't one Seventh-day Adventist church in that county. It was called a dark county. There was no truth being preached. And so when we ended up getting a hold of these VHS tapes from Doug Batchelor and Amazing Facts and from Kenneth Cox and from Mark Finley, oh, have mercy, beloved, we got so excited. We started hearing these truths that we were reading in our Bible and we wondered why nobody was preaching them. We was like, man, this, this truth is powerful. It's life-changing. This is the truth. We have finally found the truth. But there wasn't a church for us to go to. My family was on fire. My mom and dad was on fire. Everybody was on fire. You could could have thrown water on us and and it would have evaporated. We were on fire that much. No doubt about it, beloved. God was moving powerfully in my family. And then what happened? One day, one day, we got the opportunity to go to a Seventh-day Adventist church. And man, I was so excited. You know, my, my brother invited me. You got to come to this church. My brother invited me. So I was so pumped to meet the people who know the truth. Oh, man, I was so excited about it. We get there to the church. We walk in. And it's Sabbath school, and there's like six cars in the parking lot. I'm like, well, where's all the people at? We walk in, and we started to have service with them. Now, I'm not going to tell you what church, because it doesn't matter. This is the the condition of most churches that I go to nowadays. We walk in, and everyone starts to visit with us and talk to us, but, but it wasn't really a visiting in the sense of, I really would like to get to know you and who you are. It was just a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And that was the extent of the visiting and the talking. Can anyone relate to what I just said? 
Let's see by a show of hands. Oh, the whole congregation, no doubt. We're sitting there. We're excited to hear the truth preached from a church that believes the truth. And while we're sitting there in the crowd, we've, we've, heard, we've heard these messages on VHS tapes. We've heard these messages from Mark Finley, Doug Batchelor, Kenneth Cox, and all of that. We, we come in, and we're expecting to meet these people that know the truth, and it'd be an awesome time. Like, hey, man, you guys know the truth, man. We just learned the truth. Today. You know, we're excited about it, and when we walk in, these people look like they wouldn't have known Jesus if he was standing right in front of them. Can anyone relate to what I just said there? I'll never forget... I start trying to walk up to the church members afterwards and I start trying to visit with them. Because I want to get to know these people that know the truth. I'm excited, man. I'm pumped. And I walk up to these people. I'm like, hey, man. I'm like, how's it going? My name's Dakota. I'm Ryan's brother. He's been coming here a while. Um, man, so how did you learn the truth? Well, I just studied. Okay. You studied, all right. Well, hey, man, uh, so what's your name? Tells me his name. I'm still standing there like. Okay. I ask him, I say, well, hey, brother, I said, so, so what's your position here in the church? Elder. I'm standing around, I'm like, okay, all right, well, uh, I kind of go over to someone else. I'm like, well, maybe this brother just isn't talkative today. Maybe he's had a bad day or something. So I'll go over to another church member, and I start talking to them. Hey, so uh, do you have any kids? Yep. Well, how many kids do you have? Four. I mean, you think that they could care less about having a conversation with me altogether? And these are the people that know the truth. Are we together, saints? I'm walking out of the church. Now, by the way, keep in mind, not everyone's a Seventh-day Adventist. Can we say amen? I'm walking out of the church, and in my mind, I'm thinking, I cannot believe this. These are the people that know the truth? I'm trying to wrestle with this, my, this, this, what, my experience of me going to a Seventh-day Adventist church with the reality that I saw on VHS tapes, and I'm going, both were a reality, but they're so dichotomous. They're so different from one another. And as I'm walking out the church, a church member says, oh, hey, would you like to have haystacks with us? Now, beloved, listen to me. I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I have no blooming idea what haystacks are. I'm, and I'm like, I look to my brother for the translation. I go, haystacks. He's like, he just kind of smiles. He's like, it's basically like a taco salad. And I'm thinking in my mind, you want me to stay for potluck after having such a miserable experience here? Are we together? Can anyone relate to this message so far? No doubt. You see, God has committed so much beautiful truth, beloved, to our church. For such a time as this. And what's amazing is the majority of the people I visit with, the majority of the people I meet along the road, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians that I meet that's supposed to know the truth and be the expositors or or the or rather the, the oracles of God to the world, they act like they don't even know him. And the reality is, many of them don't. What they know is doctrine, not the doctor. Many of them know the rules. They don't know the ruler. Many of them know the word of God and can quote it to you very proudly and boastfully, but they don't know the God of the word. Beloved, this is a problem. And it's not being talked about and it's not being communicated from the pulpits and it should be. When you go back and study the book of Acts, The glory that attended that first church, man, it's inspiring. I mean, you have a man named Paul 
who used to be Saul, who used to persecute the Christians, and then he was converted to Jesus, and then he goes forth preaching the truth. This man was stoned to death because of him preaching the gospel. The Bible says the very next day he went forth to preach the gospel more. You and I have someone throw a, 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 a verbal stone at us and we stop preaching the gospel. You better not preach that, Pastor. You better not tell us that. I don't want to hear that. Have mercy, beloved. If you don't want to hear the truth, you're in the wrong church. Amen? You need to go sell watermelons. Amen? You see, beloved, the first church, the, the book of Acts, that, the glory that attended that first church, you go read Acts 17, verse 6. They referred to that first church as the men who have turned the world upside down. Why? Because they were in one mind and one accord. Not a Camry, but a chord. And they were working together for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They did not care who they offended. They did not care to be lauded and applauded. They wanted men to be saved by the gospel of Jesus. What amazes me is when I did Bible work and I would go knocking on all these doors. I would knock on this door. Knock, knock, knock. Someone would answer the door. I'm not interested in the Jehovah's Witnesses. Boom! I'm thinking, huh. I walk away, knock on another door. Latter-day Saint, no. Boom! Beloved, and as I was walking away, I was almost getting discouraged. I'm thinking, Lord, no one wants to, you know, everybody thinks I'm Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormon. I don't even dress like them. But everyone's thinking that. Here's what's amazing. The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are reaching the world more enthusiastically with their error than we are with the truth. Have mercy. I should be able to knock on someone's door and they immediately say, Seventh-day Adventist? Yep. Amen? We have two churches that's outdoing us when it comes to witnessing. How many people have you met? And you say, oh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. What's that? What's that? And you know whose fault that is? Do this right here. That's my fault. That's your fault. That's our whole church's fault. I, I run as an evangelist. I call pastors. I call uh, conferences. I call different people. And you will be amazed as to how many churches will tell us, I'm sorry, we're not doing the public evangelism this year. Newsflash, beloved. Those of you watching online, newsflash. If you're not going to do at least one public evangelistic campaign per year, close the doors. Have church at home. God did not put us here to be some kind of spiritual vacuous praise club where we come together and say, Hallelujah, Happy Sabbath, praise the Lord, Amen, and then go home and watch Andy Griffith. Pastors who don't know the truth are more zealous for error than we are for the truth there's a big problem. Did you hear what I said? If pastors who don't know the truth and are more zealous for error than we are for truth and enthusiastic for error than we are for truth, we have a big problem. I'm going to tell you this message is not going to be popular. But it's the truth the truth, beloved. I wish I didn't have to preach this message. I really do. But this wasn't my choice to preach this message this morning. It was God's choice. And I'm just being obedient to him. Let me tell you Rodney's testimony. 
Rodney, as a young boy, he was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Rodney, he went to the Adventist church for many, many years, and then he eventually left the church right around his teenage years when he became 18 or so. He ended up going and finding him a, a, a young lady that he married, and they started having children. And then Rodney and his wife started to realize, you know, we don't really want to be like we used to be. We need to start getting right with God. But the problem was Rodney married a Baptist. But he was a Seventh-day Adventist. And so Rodney and his wife start to talk about, well, which church are we going to take our children to? Are we going to take them to the Baptist church or the Seventh-day Adventist church? And Rodney then makes an appeal to his wife and his children. He says, hey, guys, listen. I know that you were raised Baptist, and I know that you were raised that way, but let me share something with you. God's true church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. I know this with all of my heart, soul, and mind. He says, I'm telling you, that's the church we should take our family to. That's the church we should go to. And so what happens is that Rodney and his wife, they get in their van, and they drive to the Seventh-day Adventist church there in their local town, and they walk through the doors. And what kind of experience do you think Rodney and his wife and their children had? You see, beloved, they walked in, and then they walked out after service was over with. Rodney said, I sat in my vehicle. He said, and as I sat in my vehicle, he said, I was totally bum puzzled. He said, because, you know, I went to church as a kid. He said, but I didn't really pay much attention to it. He said, this time I was paying attention to it. He said, and, and, and these people look like they didn't know Jesus at all. He said, the pastor preached one of the most boring sermons I've ever heard. The Sabbath school teacher just read the lesson. She didn't even talk about it. She just read the lesson. She didn't go into any. And, and, and he said, and it was just a message. It was just a message. He says, but it was so dull and so boring that we're wondering, how is this God's true church? His wife looks at him and is like, uh, babe, are you sure this is God's true church? Rodney began to wonder himself after what he experienced. But the Holy Spirit continually convicted him. He told his family, he said, listen, I know we didn't have a good experience this time. No one talked to us. No one had anything to do with us. No one hardly welcomed us and shook our hand and invited us to potluck or anything. He said, so, yeah, it was a bad experience. He said, but look, maybe that was a fluke. Maybe they had a bad week. So let's go back to church again next week, and let's just see before we go to the Baptist church. So they go back to the Seventh-day Adventist church another time, the next week. What do you think happened? Do you think anything changed? No. No one talked to them. No one befriended them. No one had anything to do with them. And they walk back out to their car, and they leave. And the next Sunday, the very next day, they decided they were going to go to the Baptist church. So they go to the Baptist church. The moment that they walk in the doors, there's about five or six people standing outside saying, oh, it's so good to see you guys. What's your names? And, oh, it's so good. These are your children. Oh, that's wonderful. Come on in. We're so happy to have you here. And they invited them in, and they were just like, whoa, like, okay, cool. And it was a nice church, and all the people were very nice, and, and everyone was so welcoming. And the pastor, he, he was a very nice guy, and everyone invited them to potluck afterwards. And, and they started to inviting them to their homes for supper, and they started to invite them for church events and all of these things. And they actually felt like they were a part of the family. True story, by the way. Rodney said he then was invited to join the church by baptism and his whole family. He said, so we decided, well, we've been going so far, we might as well join. And, and so he, him and his wife and his children, they were baptized into the church. He said, and after the baptism, he said, the pastor brought us before the entire congregation. He said, and we sat in front of the whole congregation. He said, and this was a big church, about 200 plus. Every single church member lined up around the church and came by and hugged Rodney and his family and said, thank you so much for accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We love you guys, and we're so happy to have you part of our family.
Rodney said he goes home, and he's realizing he just joined this church. But he said, deep down in my mind, I knew this church did not have the truth that the Seventh-day Adventist church had. He said, but the problem was, he said, I'm looking at the reality. He says, the Seventh-day Adventist church has ten-tenths of the truth. They have it all. Ten-tenths of the truth. He says, the Baptist church has like two-tenths of the truth, and yet these people act like they know, more than, know, know Jesus more than these people that know ten-tenths of the truth. Long story short, Rodney eventually listened to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And he went back and withdrawed his membership from the Baptist church. And he went and joined that dead church that he really didn't want to join, but he knew that it was the true church. He said, I couldn't quite put it together how it's the true church, other than they have the knowledge of the truth, but they don't act like it. He said, but... but that's what I had to do. Now let me tell you something. Rodney joined the church only by the grace of God. For every story like that that you hear, you hear about another hundred more who leave the church and never come back at all. Rodney is the current pastor of the Fayetteville Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Arkansas. Still going strong for Jesus. So there's positivity in this message. Can we say amen? But the problem that attends our church needs to be fixed. Can someone say amen to that? You see, you may be thinking, Dakota, this is not the place to do this. You know, you, you shouldn't be preaching this message from the pulpit because you know Dakota. I mean, this is a Matthew 18 message. Do this right here. No, it's not, beloved. You see, Matthew 18 is all about if someone sins against you personally, Can we say amen? This is not a personal matter. This is a very public matter. Let me share with you the difference. Go to Galatians chapter 2 with me. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. Notice what it says here. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. He withstood him to his what? Notice he didn't go behind the elders into the church board and say, hey. What did he do, beloved? He went right to Peter's face. And notice what he says. Because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, speaking of the the, the, uh, uh, Gentiles, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away by their dissimulation. So what happened here? Paul, or rather Peter, is eating with the Gentiles. In walks the other brothers, the other Jews. Right? These Jews walk in, and then what happens is that Peter kind of looks over and he's like, oh man, I wonder what these Jews are going to think about me sitting with these Gentiles. It is of the tradition that we don't sit with Gentiles, that we don't commune with Gentiles, even though I know this is to be the case, and even though I know that this is what God showed me in Acts chapter 10, I'm going to go ahead and get up anyways. He gets up and he goes and sits with his Jewish brethren, who was of the circumcision. All because these brothers over here had not been snip-snipped yet. So what does he do? He, he comes and sits down with them. And then Barnabas gets up and he causes a dissimulation. And then Barnabas goes and he joins them. And it, it's like that, that scene at the lunchroom in the cafeteria when we went to high school. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're trying to make friends with, with Bob. And Bob's a good guy. You like Bob. You're wanting to be friends with him. You're trying to make new friends. But then here comes Ray and Brenda and all the popular kids. And they're like, hey, Hey, Dakota, come sit with us. Why are you sitting with that loser? And then we're like, hey, guys. Sorry, Bob. 
What does Peter, what does Paul do? Peter does this open sin. He causes a, a, a wedge to be put in the church. That's sin, beloved. And so what does Paul do here? Notice what it says. But when I saw that he walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to, unto Peter before them, how much? Before them all. He said, I said to Peter before them all, in front of them all. If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Are you with me, beloved? He says here very clearly, he's like, if, if you're going to be a Jew and you're going to command everyone else to be a Jew, the Gentiles to be a Jew, why aren't you following your own advice? You're not being like Jesus. And so what, and so what happened here was that Paul did what the Spirit of God told him to do. He gets up, and when he sees a public sin, a public problem, he confronts it. And he says, hey, listen, we ought not to live that way. Amen? Amen. I have a question. Where are the Pauls of the Seventh-day Adventist church that will confront the Peters? Where are the Pauls that will cry aloud, spare not, and, and, and blow the trumpet and give the trumpet a certain sound about the issues that no one's talking about. I'm tired of hearing about women's ordination. I'm tired of hearing about all these other issues that we've already voted on. Let's talk about the ones now that we haven't even addressed. You see, what we're dealing with is similar to the old story of the emperor's new clothes. How many of you guys have heard this story? The emperor's new clothes. Let me tell you the story. There's a couple of tailors, that, shifty tailors that come into town. A couple of hucksters, and they come in town with their henchmen, and they start proclaiming throughout all of, the, all of the region that they have some golden thread specialized for the king. And they want to give the king and deliver to this king this golden thread for a price. And so the king hears about these special golden thread that is unlike anything that any other king has ever worn. And these shifty tailors are presented before the king and, and he, he presents himself to, to, to be delivered or to be uh, put before the, the tailors and, and they say, okay, take your clothes off there. He takes his clothes off and, and then they take this little golden thread, just all it was. He was, they was think, he was thinking he was going to get actual clothes and they gave him a golden thread and wrapped it around him and they said, ooh, ah. Perfect. But the reality was, beloved, is that he was naked. There he is standing there stark naked, and they're going, ah, hoo, ha, perfect. And the king began to look at himself. He goes, oh, well, well, I, I don't understand. I mean, I don't see what they see. I mean, I, I'm not wearing anything. I can't see how they... But he continued to allow the oohs and the ahs of the tailors and his henchmen to benumb his mind and to make him think that there was nothing wrong with himself. When the reality was, is that he was naked. And there was something very wrong. You see, I believe that we've been looking at their emperor's clothes too long, ooing and eyeing. We need to find Christ in his righteousness. I want to address something now. Something that I've been hearing from lots of my people that attend my evangelistic meetings that come out. And that's the deliverance of the gospel. Through the leaders, the elders, the pastors, and so on. There's an old revivalist, his name is Leonard Ravenhill. He's a great revivalist, you ought to get familiar with some of his writing. He doesn't believe the whole truth and know the whole truth like we do, but... I'll tell you one thing about this man is that he understood revival. He understood sacrifice. He said this, the tragedy of this late hour is that we have too many dead men in the pulpits giving out too many dead sermons to too many dead people. Did you hear that? The tragedy of this late hour, we have too many dead men in the pulpits giving out too many dead sermons to too many dead people. You know, what are we doing this weekend here in Hot Springs? What's it called? Come on now. A revival. 
How, why do you have to revive someone? It's because they've died. Can we say amen? But you may be sitting there saying, oh, I haven't died. And maybe that's why you didn't show up last night. I don't know. But beloved, we always need revivals in our lives. We always need to keep our eyes fastened upon Jesus and his message and his truth. None of us can escape the doldrums of temptation without keeping our eyes fastened on Jesus. I had a young man come to me in my meetings. He's actually a little, little bit older than me. He's in his 30s, I believe. He came to me in my, in my, my last seminar I just preached in, in uh, Colorado. He walked up to me and he said, Dakota, I have a question, man. I said, what's that, brother? He says, man, he's like, I've never heard an Adventist preacher preach like you've preached. Now, I'm not tooting my own horn here when I tell you this. I'm getting somewhere with this. Can we say amen? He says, I've never heard a preacher preach like you preach. I said, well, brother, what are you talking about? He said, when you preach, he said, it's like you really believe what you're saying. And I said, oh, I see what you mean, brother. And he said, man, I can't tell you how many churches I've been to and I visited an Adventist church. He said, and I get up, he said, and the elders or the, the deacons or, or the pastor sometimes even will be preaching. He says, and it seems like they don't even know God. It seems like that, that the truth that I learned on those tapes, because he had a very similar experience to me, to me, it's not the same experience that these people are that's preaching. It's like they know a different kind of Jesus. He said, but I come and I listen to you. He's like, man, you preach with conviction. You preach. He's in a different way. There's, you, you preach like you really believe it. And I said, brother, that's because I do. He said, but how is it that you preach that? Why, how, why do you preach that way? Why is it that they preach that way and, and you preach that way? He said, I'm, I'm confused. So I told him the story that inspired me many years ago. This is from the inspired writings of the pen of inspiration, Ellen White. She says, on a certain occasion, when Betterton, the celebrated actor, was dining with Dr. Sheldon, Archbishop of Canterbury. Archbishop of Canterbury is the leader of the Church of England. And they were dining together, and, and this Archbishop says to this actor, this famous actor, he says, Mr. Betterton, Tell me, why is it that you actors affect your audiences so powerfully by speaking of things that are imaginary? He says, how is it that you guys, you actors, y'all speak and talk of things that are imaginary, but you speak so powerfully and you move the people and you get them crying and you get them excited and you, get them, you, can, you, can, you can just totally just play, play with them and get them to move any way you want. He said, you affect the people. They come out. That you're, you crowd, you stack out the buildings, you pack out the house. He said, how is it that you do that and you speak of things that are imaginary? Notice what he says. He says, my Lord, replied Betterton, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain. He says, it all lies in the power of enthusiasm. It all lies where? in the power of enthusiasm. He says, we on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they are real. But you behind the pulpits speak of things that are real as if they are imaginary. I found that to be very interesting. And as a young man, when I first joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I came across that. God shared that with me. And I looked at the church and the condition of it, and I said, have mercy. I don't want to be like one of these dead preachers. When I preach God's word, I want people to be moved to conviction. I want people to want to know Jesus like never before. But such is not the case with so many today. Let me share with you Sharon's testimony. Earlier in one of my seminars earlier this year, a woman came to me and she said, Dakota, she said, you know, I left the church for many years and then I came back. And when I came back, she said, 
it was so bad. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I, I came and I, me and, me and my husband, we came for the test, or we came for the, 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 uh, the message that morning. She says, we show up for the message that morning and one of the elders was preaching. And it was so bad, Dakota. It was so boring that me and my husband just got up and left. We couldn't bear to listen to it. She said, in fact, me and my husband learned to look at the preaching schedule to find out who was preaching. And when the pastor was preaching, that's when we went. And when there was an elder preaching, we've heard them all. They're so bad. They're so horrible. We, just, we would rather stay home than to go to church because when we go to church, we come back home more discouraged having gone to church than what we do when we stay home. Now, someone show me by a show of hands. How many of you have had that experience? God is watching. Let's be honest. Many of us. Now, some of you may be saying, but yeah, but you don't go to church for the preacher. And I say that, amen. You don't go to church for the preacher. You know, we shouldn't be coming to church with our hand held out saying, what can God give me today? Because worship and coming to church is not about you, beloved. It's about God. I agree with that. I do. Can we say amen to that? Church is not about what do I get. Church is about what does God get. Does God get adoration? Does he get love? Does he get worship? That's what church is about. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And that's why I continually go. But let me tell you something, beloved. It is a shame that we allow people to get in this holy position and preach boring messages as if they were already in the coffin. I'll tell us this morning, if you are not going to live up to the Seventh-day Adventist truth and you know that and you haven't lived and you know that you're just not going to live up to it and you've already made your mind up for it, let me tell you something. Change your life or change your name. Can we say amen to that? Change your life or change your name. God has commissioned us as a church to be a solemn people to the world a warning to the world, a message of love and of truth that saves to the uttermost, not in sin, but from sin. Jesus has called us to this message, to preach the three angels' message of the everlasting gospel to the whole world. But so many today are not being fed, not only because they're not reading their Bibles, on their own time, but because when they come to church, they get more discouraged coming than they do when they stay home. This is the sad reality that's pervading our church, beloved. I can't count the times. Remember I told you, I almost left the church. I would go to the church and go to the church and go to the church, and I would see so much ridiculous things that was never being addressed. The pastor just acting as if it was not even there. Acting as if it's not even an issue. Because what? They're seeing the emperor's new clothes. We are naked. And we need to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. But everyone seems to be totally fine. Totally complacent with our nakedness. I want to say this. This idea of turn-taking for, pre for the preaching schedule is not found in the Bible. Oh, I'm going to drive this one home. This idea in the Seventh-day Adventist church for, well, who's on the preaching schedule this week? Is it your turn to preach, or is it my turn to preach, or is it her turn to preach? It's not biblical, my friends. It's not biblical. It's not about, is it your turn to be heard? Can we say Amen. Why do I say that with such enthusiasm? Here's why. Because everyone has gifts. Can we say amen to that? And not everyone has the same gift. Let me share something with you. There was a woman one day at a church I went to. And I'm, this is just an example. I'm not bashing on women because I believe women can preach powerful messages too. Amen? I'm not bashing on women. I'm not against women preachers or women sharing the truth. We all can share the truth. But... We're not all meant to share the truth from this position. 
Can we say amen? This lady gets up, and it was women's ministry Sabbath. And she gets up, and she's not a minister in the sense that, you know, she would be up here preaching. And so instead of, instead of going to Adventist material and reading something from Adventist material, if she was going to read something, she goes to Max Licato. And she reads the false gospel from Max Licato's book. That we will always be sinning until Jesus comes. That was the message preached that Sabbath morning. I'm sitting in the crowd, like you are today. I'm sitting out in the pew, and I'm going. And I'm, I'm hearing that, and I'm, going, I'm looking around to see if anyone else is bugging their eyes out. Everyone else is just like. And I'm looking around, and I just wanted to say, hey, what are you guys doing? That day, I'll never forget it, God, he convicted me. And he said, Dakota, stand up right now and gently and lovingly rebuke. Now, the word rebuke, it sounds such like a bad word to us. We don't want no one to rebuke us. It sounds like, ooh, don't do that. But beloved, the word rebuke means to correct. Mercy. If When I was in algebra class, we got up on the, uh, our whole class had to get up and do our homework on the board. And, and Miss Wells, my algebra teacher, she, she would have us to write our problems down on the board. And, and then we would have to work out our problem and show the work. And if I gave the wrong answer, she didn't just say, hmm, oh, you know, that's a great way to look at that. No. Have mercy, beloved. She said, eh, wrong. Let me show you how to really do it. Are we together? Our algebra teacher has more backbone sometimes than some ministers. And that day, I was a, I had pusillanimous faith that day. No doubt about it. Cowardice faith. God told me, stand up and give her a gentle rebuke and ask this congregation to wake up and let's start believing the real gospel. Stop reading from, from false gospel material. But you know what I did? I thought, oh Lord, but if I do that, everyone will misunderstand me. They will think I'm trying to be mean to this poor lady who's just trying to do what she is trying to do for women's ministry. And so I said, God, I, I can't do it. And guess what? I didn't do it. I'm driving home and the Spirit of God came upon me. I just felt this overwhelming like tug at my heart. It was almost as if God grabbed me by the tie and said, don't ever do that again lest I stop using you. True story. And from that point forward, beloved, when I hear someone share something that is false, in love, in what? In love, I correct it. You might find me to be stern. You might even want to call it unloving. Call it what you want, beloved, but that's what we're supposed to do. Not everyone has the same gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through 31. Notice what it says here. Open your Bibles with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through 31. It says, Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after, the miracles, or after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? I got a question. Are we all apostles, beloved? No. Notice what he says. Are all apostles, are all prophets? Are we all prophets? No. Are all workers of miracles and all, are all teachers? No. Have all the gifts of healing? How many of you have the gift of healing? Okay. Do all speak with tongues? How many of you have the gift of tongues? Maybe a few of you. Do all interpret? The point here is, is that we all don't have the same gifts. Can somebody say amen? Now, how many of you know my brother Ryan? Raise your hand. Ryan A with 3 ABM. Let me tell you something about my brother. He's a fantastic singer. He has a gift that I wish I had. Are we together? Now, I can sing. You know, I'm a tenor, by the way. 10 or 11 miles out in the woods, and I sound real good. 
Let me tell you something, beloved. I can sing, but it won't sound near as good as when my brother sings. Can we say amen? In other words, my gift that, I, that, that God has given me is not primarily to sing, but it's to preach. That's the gift God has given me, and I'm utilizing it to my, my, the most of my ability that I can. It's the power of Jesus. But if I got up here and I tried to sing a David Phelps special in that high note, if I tried to sing Oh Holy Night and hit that last note, Oh Night Divine, and such a, let me tell you something, it would sound like I'm skinning a cat. You would be ready to run out of here and plug your ears because that's not my gift. So let us not get up here thinking that it's our turn to preach and we get up here and bore people to death. Can somebody say amen? There's an old saying. It says, if you want to know how popular the Sabbath school teacher is, go to Sabbath school. If you want to know how popular the pastor is, go to worship service. And if you want to know how popular God is, go to prayer meeting. Beloved, let me tell you something. I've been to so many prayer meetings where there's a church of 100 members Five people show up to prayer meeting. I, I look around and I say, we're doing an organization meeting for an evangelistic series. We're supposed to be organizing for this evangelistic series. And I'm looking around and I say, uh, Pastor, where's the other guys at? Where's the other church members at? Oh, we normally only get about five or six here. Let me tell you something. The church better be glad I'm not a pastor. Because I probably wouldn't be a pastor of a church very long. I'm an evangelist come in, preach the truth, and I leave, and I go to another church and preach the truth. I understand I don't have to continually deal with all of the problems the pastors do, but let me tell you something. I wouldn't deal with it. Can we say amen? I would demand a change. If a church isn't going to change, I'm not going to waste my time preaching to people who are not willing to change. I'm going to move somewhere else. That's what Paul did. He preached to, he preached to, the, Gen, or to the Jews, and then, and then God said, I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Jews ain't going to hear you. Just go to the Gentiles. They'll hear you. Amen? You see, we need to be more committed five, six people showing up to prayer meeting, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. Where are we on prayer meeting? I hope we're not home watching Netflix or Hulu or whatever else program you might be watching. Amen? Beloved, I say this in love. But I say it with passion, and I want you to catch that more than anything. Because I want this to tug at your heart. We need to be more committed, my friends. I have people come out to my evangelistic meetings. Maybe a third of the church will show up. And then on Sabbath mornings, you'll see how many church members really didn't show up to your evangelistic series. Beloved, and then the, 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 the new members that are joining by baptism, they're looking around and they're seeing all these people that they don't even know. Why? Because the church members wasn't coming to the evangelistic series. We need to be more committed, my friends. Offer your employer. Some of you work at hospitals, right? Right? Some of you work in uh, where? Uh, uh, your cops? Police officers? Some of you work in the steel mills, perhaps? Some of you work at factories? Some of you work at, at perhaps Taco Bell or whatever? It doesn't matter where you work. Offer your employer what you offer God and see how long you keep your job. You only show up one day out of the week when you are scheduled to be there several days out of the week. And you say, well, what are you so mad at me for? I showed up today. You think your employer is going to take that? He'll fire you real quick. We know that. And you know what's sad about that situation? Is that the reality is, the reason why we're not showing up to church, and the reason why we're not supporting all of the church events that the church has going on, is because God does not come in first in our lives. He doesn't even get second, third, or fourth in our lives. 
Because most of us, we put our jobs first, or we put our family first, or we put this first or that first, or our kids' ball games first, or we put football games first. We put something before God. And beloved, the reality is, is that we cannot make it to heaven with that mindset. We have to start putting God first in all things that we do. Let me read you a poem I came across. I thought this was very powerful. It's titled, Isn't It Strange? Listen to this. Isn't it strange how $100 seems like a large amount when you donate it to the church, but a very small amount when you go shopping? Isn't it strange how endless hour an hour seems when we are serving God, or how endless an hour seems when we are serving God, but how short it is when we watch a football game or 60 minutes worth of whatever program you may be watching on television. Isn't it strange how two hours seems so long sitting at church and how short it seems when you're watching a good movie? Isn't it strange that you can't find things to say when you're praying, but you have all the things in the world to talk about with a friend? Isn't it strange how difficult and boring it is to read one chapter of the Bible, but how easy it is to read 100 pages of a popular novel? Isn't it strange how easy it is to stay up to 3 o'clock in the morning binge-watching something on Netflix, but how quick you fall asleep when you grab your Bible? Isn't it strange how we need to know about an event for church two or three weeks before the day so we can include it in our agenda, but we can adjust it for about any event outside of church. Isn't it strange how difficult it is to learn a fact about God, to share it with others, but how easy it is to learn and under, or how hard it is to learn and understand, or how easy it is to learn and understand gossip, rather? Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange how everyone wants a place in heaven, but they don't want to believe or do or say anything to get there? Isn't it strange? The reality is, beloved, why has all of this stuff happened? We'll get to that. It's because of a neglect for the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Can problems that are not corrected make the church unsuccessful? Yes or no? Absolutely. Let me give you a good example of that in the Bible. Achan. Remember Achan? How many of you remember Achan in the Bible? Joshua chapter 7. Achan goes in, long story short, and what does he do? He steals what God told, told Israel, told all of Israel, do not take that which is uh, accursed from Jericho. Don't take it from Jericho. But what does he do? He sees this Babylonian garment, and he sees this, uh, this silver, and he takes it, and he puts it in his tent. And then they go to war against another nation. And when they go to war, go and read the details of it. Joshua sent about two to 3,000 in that war to defeat this village, to defeat these people. There were only 37 men that fought back to those two or 3,000, and those 37 men defeated the two or 3,000 Israelites. Joshua was so upset, he started tearing his garments. What, Lord? What did you do? How did we get like? I thought you were going to deliver us and send us through this, and we were going to have back the promised land. What's going on, God? And God says, hey, there was a cursed thing among Israel. A cursed thing. So they bring all the people before. They begin to pray and seek their hearts. And then Achan comes before the children of Israel. And we talked about it this morning in Sabbath school. True repentance versus forced guilt. Appreciate Mr. Jilda for bringing that out. Very beautiful. Achan was forced to bring out his sin. And what had happened? He was killed. And his family. Because they were culprits to the sin of Achan. You see, beloved, the church is an event to many and not a lifestyle. It's an event. It's somewhere we go once or twice a week and then we go home. Beloved, church is not supposed to be an event. It's supposed to be a lifestyle. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Are we just going through the motions or do we really mean it? 
I can't count the churches I've been to. When we sing the doxology or when we sing something, it sounds like a bunch of dead people singing at a funeral. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Beloved, I have a question. Do you think we're going to be singing like that in heaven? Sometimes we get caught up going through the motions of things, and that's exactly what it becomes. Just another thing that we do at church rather than truly worshiping God from our heart. Beloved, if we keep Jesus the center of our focus, we will not be caught up going through the motions, but we will serve Jesus with all of our heart, mind, and soul. Amen? Amen. No doubt about it. You see, we need to be a family. A what? A family. I have attended so many churches in the Adventist church as I've traveled. And you, what, what happens is that church is over with, everyone just goes to their own house, and that's it. You never see the church come together and do any fun events together, do anything together. It's all just separate and individual, and we only come together for worship service. How many of you have seen that? Beloved, churches like that do not last very long. We need to be a family. We are the family of God. Can somebody say amen? God has called us to be a family. Now, what's the cause of all this deadness? As I said, it's a neglect of the cross of Christ. In closing, I'm going to read you this. Check this out. I have long closings. I'm just going to warn you. Revelation 2, verses 1 through 5. This is Jesus speaking to the church of Ephesus. He says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works. You hear what Jesus said to them? Every church, he starts off by saying to them, I know your works. Because you know what works are? It shows your true faith. Amen? It shows who you really are. He says, I know your works. And the labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not stand there or bear them, which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. I love this. He starts listing all the things that they've done good, right? Like, man, you guys can't stand evildoers. I know your works. Uh, you're patient. You're all these things. You, hey, you, you guys are testing those who, are, who say that they're apostles and you found them liars. You're studying to show yourself approved. But notice what he says. He says, you've labored and have not fainted. You're hard workers, he says. And I would like to submit, there's a whole lot of Seventh-day Adventists, hard workers. Amen? He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He's, they've left their what? Beloved, how many of you remember falling in love? I talked a little bit about it last night in the revival, right? When we fall in love, what happens? We're so excited. My wife gave me that letter. And she handed me the letter. She wrote me, oh, man, I was so pumped. I couldn't wait to go and read it. I would even go to the stinky bathroom and read it. Because I couldn't read it in class for the fear of someone, you know, the teacher snatching it, reading it in front of the class. So I'd go to the classroom, or go to the bathroom, rather, and I would, I'd open it up and I'd read it. And I'd just, oh, man. Oh, that's so precious. That's so beautiful. I love that. She loves me. I love her, too. And I, I'd write her back. It was such a close, beautiful thing. But Jesus says, you've left your first love. In other words, your love for Jesus has not increased, it's decreased. This is what happened to Israel to cause them to divorce themselves from God. He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of its place except you repent. Now beloved, what's a candlestick a symbol of in the Bible? Come on somebody, tell me. It's a symbol of the church in Revelation. The candlesticks were the church, the seven churches of Asia Minor. He says, hey, hey, guys, listen, you better repent. In other words, turn from your ways, lest I remove your candlestick out of its place. You say, Dakota, are you preaching that God's going to do away with the Seventh-day Adventist church? Do this right here. No, that's not what I'm saying. But will God close down a local congregation? You see the difference? The true, God will always have a remnant, my friends. The question is, will you be a part of it? 
or will you be caught up in the deadness? 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. I love this. Such a beautiful way for God to pour his heart out and to call upon his people. 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, and the Seventh-day Adventist church is definitely called by Jesus' name. Can we say amen? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, is it conditional? It's conditional, my friends. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I would like to even say that God will do the same for that local congregation that may be in absolute deadness. He will revive it, beloved. He will give you pastors after his own heart that preaches with, with power and conviction under the Holy Spirit. Instead of people that are just hirelings there to have a check and to earn some pay. You see, hirelings don't care for the flock. Pastors do. Amen? Revelation 3, verses 14 through 18. This is, the, this is the, the warning, the appeal to our church age, the Laodicean church age. Beloved, this is for you and me. You may be saying, Dakota, you're going too long. Let me say something. Let me ask you a question. What day is it? It's Sabbath. Where else do you have to be? Amen? Amen? Revelation 3, verses 14 through 18. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. There it is again. Does God know your works? Does he know my works? He knows all of our works, beloved. We can't hide from God. Notice, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. He says, but I would that you were cold or hot. Jesus says, I would rather you be cold or hot. But notice what he says. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Why does someone vomit? Because they're sick. This lukewarm attitude that so many of us have allowed to creep in to our minds and hearts. Beloved, that makes Jesus sick. And he says, listen, I do not like lukewarm temperatures. I'd like to have you cold. I'd like to have you hot. You know, it doesn't mean that, oh, we got to be on fire for God and be hot. No, no, no. What God's saying is that, hey, I can work with a cold person. You know why? Because how many of you have ever been really, really cold? When you're really, really cold, what happens? You want to get really, really hot, don't you? And when you're really, really hot, what happens? You want to be really, really cold. Amen? So God's saying, in other words, I can work with someone that's hot or cold, but someone that's lukewarm, if you're lukewarm, you're real comfortable, right? Ah, real comfortable. Don't try to change anything now, Dakota. Don't try to bring in anything new, any new. Thing. Don't try to change anything now. That kind of attitude Jesus can't work with. He says, I counsel, or he says right here, because thou say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know how many churches I've been to it feels like there isn't a thing wrong with their church? It's deader than a doornail. The church member goes, oh, I'm just so happy here. They're not winning anyone to Jesus. Haven't had an evangelistic campaign in 20 years. Haven't done anything to reach the public. It's a club. Let me tell you something, beloved. Jesus isn't interested in being a part of any club. You know what clubs are like that? Churches are like that? They're secret societies. Jesus don't like secret societies. Because Jesus' truth is to be public. Not secret. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, and that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He, what is Jesus saying? The emperor's new clothes. You're naked. 
We are naked. That's our problem. We are not, we don't have the righteousness of Christ. What's the righteousness? The right doing of Christ. We don't have it. We know the intellectual truth. We know the rules, and we know the Word of God, and we know the doctrines, but we don't know the doctor, we don't know the God of the Word, and we certainly don't know the ruler. Beloved, we've got to get to know the ruler. Amen? The problem that attended Jesus at his birth is the same problem that attends Jesus today. What time is it? It's Christmas time, right? Right? Amen? And we start focusing on what? What about Christ's life? Do we start focusing on this time of the year? His birth. Amen? His birth. We start looking at his birth. We start studying his birth and looking at things. Oh, man, isn't that beautiful? Jesus came into the world. Yes, 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 yes. That's all beautiful. But the same problem that Jesus had when he first came as a little babe to this world is the same problem that he has today. There was no room in the end for Jesus. In Revelation, Jesus tells those that are about to be thrown into the lake of fire, there was no place found for them. You know why? Because they didn't find a place for Jesus in their heart. The same problem that accustomed Jesus at his birth is the same problem that is, a, is accustoming Jesus today. We see right there, beloved, Jesus had no room in the end. There was no room for him in the end. And there's no room for him in so many people's lives today. People are not surrendering to Jesus the way that they should. Revelation 3 and verse 19. What is, notice what it says. As many as I love. As many as I what? I love, I rebuke, and chasten. That means to correct. Therefore, be zealous and repent. What does repent mean, beloved? To turn. To turn from that nakedness and to be clothed in Jesus Christ's righteousness. You see, beloved, what we need to do, how we are to correct this problem, is to draw near the cross of Calvary. That's the correction for this big problem that we have. We must draw near the cross of Calvary. Amen? Notice the words of this beautiful hymn, as if the singers would like to get ready for our closing hymn. Notice these beautiful words. Jesus, keep me near the cross. I'm no Ryan Day. But I'll tell you one thing. I love these words, and I'm going to sing them. There's a precious fountain Free to all a healing stream Flows from Calvary's mountain What's those words? In the cross. In the cross. Be my glory ever. Till my raptured soul will find rest beyond the river. Oh, my friend, I plead to all of you here today, and I plead to every Seventh-day Adventist in the entire world. Beloved, if you see me now on that camera, wherever you may be in whatever time zone you may be in, draw near the cross of Calvary. Cling to Jesus. Amen? Look to Him and His sublime example. And He will correct these things, this deadness that is in the church. We will behold the love of God like never before when we draw near the cross of Calvary. And it is that precious love that Jesus has for us that will shape and mold our characters into his very likeness. That nakedness will be clothed with his garments. If that's your desire here this morning, and you say, I want a revival in my life, 
I need a revival in my life. As we sing this closing song, I would like to invite anyone that wants to rededicate their life to Jesus to come forward this morning, and I would like to pray for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's draw near the cross together. Amen. The Bible says, is is there any of a thirst? Let them come. Are you thirsty for Jesus, my friend? I pray that you are. Rest beyond
beloved, let us go near the cross in prayer. Oh, Jesus, oh, God, we love you. We draw near the cross now as we pray. God, give us, I pray, eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, that we may know what your Spirit says to us. And that we will have the power, Lord Jesus, through your Spirit and by your Spirit, to overcome the wiles of the devil. That all the deadness and all the grayness and all of the spiritual poverty that we have had, Lord, that it will be banished forever. As we draw near your cross, let us behold your love and your faith. That we too, as Revelation says, might have the very faith of your son Jesus, Father. And that we may overcome this wicked and sinful world and the devil of it. Lord, please, Jesus, help us to stay near the cross. Not just come in one moment, in one revival weekend, and then go right back to our passivity. But Lord, I pray that we will continually draw near this cross that you have died, beholding your love for humanity. And that, Lord, by beholding that rugged cross, that we might be changed and bear our own cross. Lord, we pray and ask you all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.